The views expressed are not those of local community broadcasting, WYML LP, or its management, volunteers, or underwriters. Greetings and welcome back to the Personal Safety Show. This is Marcus Melnick, your host from Firearm Mentor. And today we have a guest, and her name is Jennifer Ramirez. She is the founder of And Rise, which is for female survivors of trauma and abuse, and they struggle in silence if you go to our website, which is womenrisechicago.com, and we'll, we'll spell that out for you later on. You can learn all about her. Jennifer, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to our listeners today. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. So what is And Rise? Can you explain what the whole organization is, what you do, how you do it? I know it's a, you got to unpack a lot there. But. Yeah, sure. So and rise. So we have the ampersand as, you know, the and. The and means your story isn't over yet. There's more to tell. And the rise means rising above any adversities that you face. So our mission is to empower women to be the best versions of themselves, no matter what they've been through. So we offer women tons of different resources and educational workshops so that they can be their best selves, whether that's personally or professionally. So we offer health services such as free counseling in Illinois. We also offer six weekly support groups right now, which we're in the process of implementing our seventh support group for Spanish speaking women starting in November. And then we also offer career development. So we help with resumes and mock interviewing skills. We offer financial education workshops so that women can become financially independent. Um, And we just do a ton of different healing modalities for women that are trauma survivors. So we offer art therapy, Reiki. We do workshops to teach about healthy relationships, healthy or healthy coping skills, and also red flags and just a lot of different women empowerment events. You don't necessarily have to be a survivor to come to our events and to, you know, be empowered by hearing other women's experiences or just coming to be empowered through like an art therapy or like a vision board event or something like that. So that's, that's and rise in a nutshell. <laughs> That's great. I didn't really realize what it all meant, and you perfectly explained it. Jennifer, can you tell us what is your personal origin story? What's your background, and how did you get involved in founding and rise? Sure. So I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse from my father. And I also, you know, grew up hearing, keep it a secret, don't tell anyone, which was absolutely detrimental to my mental health. And then because I was taught, you know, those things and taught that my body was only to be used by men, then I grew up, became an adult and got into a lot of really toxic and abusive relationships. I was a single mom at 21 and basically was on my own mentally, physically, financially, everything. And that was pretty that was the hardest time of my life was in my early 20s, really like struggling to get through on my own and not really having a lot of support to help me with my daughter and was super broke, lived in a really bad neighborhood in Chicago because that's all I could afford at the time, shootings, gangs, all the stuff. And I was just in this horrible, toxic cycle with just a lot of toxic people around me. And I really hit rock bottom right around that time. I can't continue my life like this like how did it get so bad and I just really got motivated to do better for myself and I wanted to give my daughter better and started seeing a counselor basically my last abusive relationship ended in my early 30s so basically around 30 I was finally out of it and I was like okay I'm gonna change my life around and I started going back to school put myself through college as a single mom was raising my daughter on my own I was really starting to like delve into mental health. That's also the time when I started kind of going to counseling for the first time. I also heard a lot of negative things about counseling growing up, that it's not for us. You just pray about it and everything will be fine. Or, you know, they only want money. It doesn't work. So like, I didn't really believe in mental health until I started going and how much it really changed my life. It changed my life in so many ways. And that's why I give it to women for free now, because I don't think money should be the barrier of getting help. And I started doing these women empowerment events out of my living room. And I think it was in 2018. And I fell in love with what I was doing. And I was like, I want to do this full time, but I still was working my full time job. And I was trying to figure out how to like make it all happen. And I also started investing in real estate. So I sold one of my properties to live off that money for a while while I started And Rise. And And Rise has just grown to be what it is today. And we see a huge, huge need for the services that we offer. We've been growing every year immensely. And I'm really proud of what I've built. And 
I just know that this is just the beginning and that there's a lot more in store for me. I don't know what it is yet, but I know that this is just the beginning of the journey. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. I love that, it. Uh, yeah, I'm happy, happy to do something that I am passionate about every day. It doesn't feel terrific. like work. That's awesome. How can a listener contribute and help your organization? We get through by donations. If you can donate, that's always super helpful for our organization. We do offer a lot of things for free for women. So your donations do go back to supporting those free programs and also just volunteering. You know, we always need volunteers to help. And even if you can't help monetarily or with your time, just sharing our posts on social media or just telling your friends and family about what we're doing, because unfortunately, there's a lot of people and not just women, both men and women go through abuse. So, you know, there's a lot of people that suffer in silence. So you never know who needs these services that we offer, but maybe doesn't even know that there are services like that out there for free for them. Just sharing with other people can be super, super helpful. And we get a lot of people that come from just referrals from friends and family or from people that saw our brochure at a Starbucks or they heard us on a podcast or something or a radio show like so yeah so you just never know who needs to hear it can you share your website social media uh, name and contact information if people want to contact you or through the website whatever you prefer website is www.womenrisechicago.org and you can find us on Facebook at Women Rise Chicago. You can find us at Instagram at and, A-N-D underscore rise underscore. And then TikTok is the same, uh, and underscore rise underscore. What Thanks. content do you put on TikTok? I actually do a lot of TikTok videos about trauma and abuse, how to heal from it, you know, normal kind of side effects, if you will after going through trauma and abuse, letting people know that it's okay if you're experiencing these things, this is normal. And also sharing my personal story, you know, of abuse and sexual abuse and narcissistic abuse, financial abuse, religious abuse, even I've been through a lot of different things. And I'm very vocal and open about those things being wrong and educating people because a lot of people, including myself, I didn't know any of this stuff, honestly, until I started and rise, I had no idea that emotional abuse is a thing and verbal abuse I had no idea I just only thought what most people think is just like abuse is only if you get hit and that is absolutely false so just educating people on all the different types of abuses and helping them kind of get through it and cope with it oh you just educated me what is religious abuse religious abuse can be they're coercing you to give money or coercing you to do something physically sexually you know like there have been a lot of women that I work with that you know they've been told that if they don't have sex with this person that they will anger God and God wants them to do it for whatever reason to be enlightened there's a lot of financial abuse that happens in the churches too not all of them of course just Speaking from from what I've heard, that they're making you basically give all of your money to the church and that that's what God wants, putting fear into you. And I personally believe that God is love and he doesn't put fear into people because, you know, when the circle of abuse is always about power and control. So when churches lead off of fear and tell people, if you don't do this, you're going to hell. If you don't do that, God's going to be angry. You know, that is not right, in my opinion. And I speak against that because it shouldn't be based off of fear. You shouldn't do things out of fear because that's what happens to people in abusive relationships because they're being threatened that they're going to be beat up or I'm going to expose you to your family or whatever it is. There's a lot of different things that happens. At the end of the day, just to kind of finish this one off, God wants everybody to have autonomy and everybody has their intuition and he wants you to follow that. And anybody that's telling you that you need to follow what they say because only they know the truth and only they didn't know the way, that is an absolute red flag. You should be able to make your own decisions and follow what your instincts are telling you. And anybody that tells you opposite is probably a red flag. Terrific. That's not what I thought it was. I thought it was people guilting you into not going to services or not participating. I mean, that that can be kind of a form of it too, but yeah, it's more the the other stuff, like just actual like abuse happening. Where there's harm. Yeah. Publicly too. Yeah. Okay. Um, do does your organization also service children? No, we currently do not. However, we are starting to work with high school age kids through Chicago Public Schools and offering consent culture workshops through there. We just literally are starting that endeavor right now. So you do service children, just not not in the same way. I mean, we are children. Yeah, I guess older children, if you will. Yeah. Okay. 
What happens uh, if there's a participant and she can't find child care for her her child? Can she bring them to one of the events, like a painting event, that type of thing? Or would um, that be traumatic for the child? Now we don't have enough resources to help us with child care, but that's definitely something that I plan to do in the future because being a single mom, I was never able to go to anything either because of child care issues and not having money to pay for a babysitter. So we're definitely working on that for the future. Okay. Do children who grow up in abusive environments, do they become abusive themselves? I would say not always, but it, it can happen because, you know, abuse is also a learned behavior. So if you grew up seeing, for example, a boy grows up to see his dad beating mom all the time, he's more than likely going to, but not always because abuse is a choice. Some people grow up in domestic violence households and do not end up being abusive. And there's other people that choose to be. It is a choice. You can wake up and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to work today and I'm not going to punch my boss in the face, or you do. <laughs> so it is a choice, but I would say majority of people don't end up abuse to be abusive. However, something that I have seen is the vicious cycle of abuse is that a lot of people that grew up seeing domestic violence end up being in an abusive relationship, being like the victim, because a lot of people, you know, they just grew up seeing it. So thinking, hey, this is how every household is and realizing as they get older, wait a minute, something's wrong. This isn't normal. But that's what I grew up seeing. And I hear that from people all the time. And the same thing happened to me. I grew up seeing things growing up and then I ended up in the same situations. And I'm like, how did I end up here? And then when you think back of your childhood, you're like, oh, I grew up seeing that. So no wonder I thought it was normal at the time. Can you explain the healing process? How do people recover from an abusive upbringing? It's different for everyone because everybody heals differently. So there's no one size fits all for everyone. But I know I can speak on what I've done. I had to go through a lot of like forgiveness exercises with people that have abused me in the past. And that is a choice as well. Forgiveness is a choice. You can choose not to. I know some people don't agree with that, but I know that's worked for me. So when uh, you talk about forgiveness, I'll, I'll interrupt you. Sorry. Are you talking about in your own head, all right, I forgive this person. Or are you talking about talking to the person and having closure with them? Not necessarily. So actually, a lot of it is self-forgiveness, believe it or not. You, you know, a lot of people blame themselves for abuse, think, well, if I was just better, if I was a better kid, I wouldn't get abused. Or maybe if I did this differently, they would love me, you know. So it's a lot of self-blame. So a lot of it is self-forgiveness. Okay. And it is a choice, again, to forgive other people. But it doesn't mean that you have to tell. I always tell this to the girls that I work with. You don't have to forgive somebody and tell them that you forgave them. You can do that all on your own without letting them know. Unless you want to, you can absolutely tell them. But you don't have to talk to them at all. Because a lot of the people that I work with have to go no contact with their abusers. So they don't talk to them anymore because they're so abusive and toxic. It's completely a choice. But it, I also say, too, there's this saying that I like to say, it's like forgiveness. I choose to forgive because forgiveness sets me free because we hold all that anger, all that resentment, right. all that sadness in our hearts. So that's why I promote forgiveness, because then it's helping us to just let it go and move on. And it is definitely not easy to do, but it's definitely doable. <laughs> forgiveness doesn't mean what they did was okay. Just because you're saying I forgive you doesn't mean that their actions towards you were fine or justifiable. Right. I want to go yeah. back to Absolutely. something that you said earlier about people who are abused as children growing up and some become abusers themselves and some don't, which, which is absolutely fantastic. Would the abuse change? So for example, let's say there was a child who was physically abused, grows up, says, I'm going to decide not to physically abuse anyone else ever again and sticks with that, but then engages in narcissistic behavior or manipulative control and now it becomes emotional abuse. Is, is that a common thread that you have seen? Not really. I think it's a small percentage of people that go that route. From what I have seen and from my own personal experiences, I definitely was not like an abusive person because I'm, I'm a good, you know, I have a good heart. And I right. think most of the people that I work with are very empathetic because of abuse. Sometimes I think abuse heightens that in us, that we end up being like extra empathetic because we're trying to understand, especially as kids and physical abuse, like, 
why did that happen to me? Like, what did I do? You know, you and you blame yourself. So it's an unfortunate thing. It ends up being like that. And that's what I was saying. Like the cycle is that normally people don't become abusive. It's unfortunately, most of them end up getting into an abusive relationship and being the, the victim just because that that's what they grew up seeing and thinking like, oh, well, this is what I saw growing up. So this is how all marriages should be. And then come to find out, then you see a TikTok video or something. You're like, right. wait a minute. That's right. not normal. You know, I didn't even know. I, I know I've heard girls say, I didn't know that my family was different until I started going to my friends' houses growing up and seeing how their families acted with each other and seeing it was nothing like my own family. And that's when I realized I came from an, a domestic violence household or whatever. People don't even know until they later find out, however they find out. Are your clients involved in current criminal cases? I know you said you mentioned no contact. That's an order of protection. I, I'm just curious to see if people are coming to you while their case is in court or is it an after thing or do they come to you first and then you go to the police? I would say all the above. We get girls that are still in their, their abusive relationships, thinking about leaving or wanting to leave, but maybe don't have the means to do so or girls that have already left or girls that have left and then came back, you know, there's a lot of different scenarios, uh, any scenario you can think of. And yes, there are girls with open cases that, you know, have, taken their abuser to court and are awaiting, including myself. I have somebody, I'm awaiting a, a, a trial right now too. Do you offer victim services? And I have to explain what I mean. Obviously you're about healing and moving on with your life and getting the right skills to, to be happy. When I worked for a police department, it was actually my first week in a very, very wealthy area. I witnessed an attempted murder. It was an ex-husband running over his wife forward and back 10, 12, 15 times. And she survived very, very messed up. But what we did as a police, and he served time for attempted murder. He's, as far as I know, he got out because it was a long time ago. But what we ended up doing is we would drive the, the victim to and from court. Mm -hmm. We would say, all right, because she was very obviously unnerved and that's, Total understatement by freaked yeah. out, unnerved, anxiety ridden. Uh, and he was locked up. It wasn't like he was out on the street, but th that impedes people sometimes. So does mm -hmm. your organization do that? Will you drive a victim to court and be their support there? Or is that outside of the scope of your services? It is outside of the scope of our services. However, we do work with other nonprofits who do offer those services so if there's something that we don't specifically offer at And Rise, we do have a lot of partner organizations that we refer our clients to. Is psychological or emotional abuse subjective? In okay. other words, do people who were abused when they get older, do they see abuse in situations maybe where there isn't abuse? I would say no, just because I think sometimes people actually miss abuse signs because of the abuse <laughs> that they went okay. through. And again, going back to what I said earlier, it's almost like normal for some people. So, you know, if they like and abuse is also like repeated by the abuser and they know what they're doing, too. And so there's some, something called like victim mentality that you can get into, like kind of that woe is me where you're like, oh, you know. The world's just all against me. Nobody understands me. Nobody gets it. Nobody knows what I've been through and kind of going into that. So I think when you're in that victim mentality, I do think that you can think everyone is abusing you. And I've also met people too, where, you know, if you're just being direct and telling them no, or having boundaries, I have girls, you know, girls that I've worked with that don't like that. And they're like, you're being so mean to me. And I'm like, no, I'm just telling you no. And here's the reason why I'm not at all. Some people take assertiveness and nose as like abuse, and it is absolutely not. I do think that it can kind of get misconstrued with certain people, but I, I would say overall, no, but yes. Some people can see things as abuse that maybe aren't, but it's all just dependent on the situation. And, you know, everybody's at a different place in their journey. And maybe when you're in the beginning of your journey, you just don't even know better. So that's also why we teach about that type of stuff, too, so that people can kind of get out of that victim mode and be like, all right, like, I got to take some responsibility for not for my abuse, but 
for the things that I've done too. Because sometimes people respond with reactive abuse. So like, I don't know if you know what that is, but basically like, let's say, you know, an abuser's hitting his victim and then she fights back. That's called reactive abuse. Then he blames her and says, look at you, you're crazy. You see, I told you you're crazy. And she's like, yeah. And then so she feels crazy (laughs) because he told her she's crazy because she reacted and that maybe is out of her character. But it's also like, just I think the body's like way of reacting to something like that especially so much of like physical abuse I think you eventually just go into defense mode you know and I think that's that is it's thinking other people are attacking you can be your defense mechanism not a healthy one but that is a defensive and coping mechanism for some people do any of governmental bodies police departments fire departments even hospitals townships do they refer clients to you as well So we do work with a lot of social workers that state social workers that do refer clients to us. We work with police districts up here closer to the Portage Park area in Chicago. So we work with like the 16th district right now. And we're trying to, you know, work our way around the city and just let our presence be known to like different police organizations. We haven't reached out to the firehouses yet, but it's all all in due time. Right. (laughs) So yeah, so we do have like partnerships with, you know, the police stations and a lot of different nonprofits and also like social workers in the area and even outside of the area too. We work with women nationwide. So we get social workers from other states that refer clients to us as well. So do these out of state clients, do they participate in your services via zoom as best yes. as possible? Yes. Obviously you have some deep experience with abuse and you've turned that around and made it a positive for other people, which is Absolutely fantastic. What conferences do you participate in? What does continuing education look like for you? I don't go to a ton of conferences, to be honest with you. I always want to, but I just, you get busy. (laughs) But I do, I'm very active in always doing um, continuing education. So I'm, I'm always reading books. I'm always taking courses on different healing modalities. You know, I recently just became a Reiki master because I also do Reiki on some of the girls that I work with if they want it. And yeah, just really teaching myself because, you know, there's a lot of research that just comes out about trauma and abuse. So I'm always making sure that I'm up with everything as it's changing so that I can better educate and work with the the women that I work with and help them as much as, as we possibly can. Awesome. Can you explain what Reiki is? Yeah. So Reiki is basically, um, energy healing. So it's basically healing of the chakras, right? You have all these different chakras in your body and they can be blocked, you know? So like, let's say your throat chakra is blocked. Like you can't speak your truth. You don't have boundaries. And, you know, if you have somebody clearing that, helping you work through whatever it is you're going through, it doesn't necessarily have to be emotional. It can be physical, also ailments in your body. And you're just kind of working through somebody's energy and clearing their energy so that they can kind of heal that's kind of the easiest way that I can explain. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll give you a, an answer. Uh, <laughs> what I think about Reiki and all that good stuff. Uh, there are people out there who say, oh, it's a bunch of crap. That, that stuff, I almost said something else. That stuff doesn't work. <laughs> but what it ends up doing, if whether it works or not, it makes the person feel better. And when you feel better, you heal better. Mm-hmm. So. I wouldn't knock it. I mean, it may not be for everyone, but at the same time, yeah. if it contributes to someone's well-being, Absolutely. more power to them. Absolutely. There's studies out there that show that they have two different study groups over and the ones that received Reiki after surgery actually heal faster. You know, there's a lot of studies behind it and I truly believe in it. Obviously, that's why I do it. And I've heard really great feedback from the girls that I do it on and they say that it helps them a lot with you know their healing and a lot of the emotional stuff that they're trying to work through so and like you said it's not for everybody some people don't see a difference in it you know like when they receive it but it's all about being open to receiving and some people just aren't there and that's okay too it's not for everyone but I definitely think I love it I think it's great and I I know that all the girls that have gotten it done on them see a huge difference in how they feel after for sure so I take I go through this one place by my house. Um, they offer certification, so I had to go through Reiki one and two training first, and you know, and then I started practicing Reiki on girls, and then after that, I got certified to be a master uh, Reiki practitioner, which basically means that I can now teach other people how to do Reiki as well. Okay, and how long did it take you to get the certification? 
Um, a couple of weeks. I'm thinking like years and years and years. Oh, no. Can you talk about the new emergency number 988 for psychological emergencies? And do you communicate that with your clientele? I actually don't as much as I should, but yes, it's definitely if you're having, you know, mental health issues, whatever that may be, anxiety, depression, and you just don't know where to go. It's also for suicidal thoughts as well. Um, and then they can refer you to, to somewhere else. But yeah, it's a great, it's just a great number to call if you're needing resources, like you're needing help, but you don't know where to go. They can give you referrals, counseling or support groups or, you know, legal services or whatever it is that you're needing as far as like mental health goes. And I haven't really like delved into that, but I know that that's something newer that came out. I think it was last summer that that came out, right. but yeah. And we, I think we have that on our website as well. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's newer and it, it's hard to implement something immediately. It takes time right? and you have to yeah. figure out your messaging. And I, I get that. So that was just a curiosity thing. When you do activities with the women in the group or groups, do men ever come and facilitate or teach, or is it 100% female? No, it's 100% female. Okay. And the reason being is because a lot of these women, their abusers were men, and so that's why I normally just have women teaching just because I think it makes a lot of them feel comfortable. I always want people to feel safe and comfortable at our events, you know, or anything that they come to. So, yeah, we mainly work with women. Jennifer, thank you very much for taking time to talk to our listeners. Is there anything else that you would like to share that perhaps I didn't ask you about your program? And I, I'd love it if you can reshare your contact information. Definitely check us out. We're doing a lot of really great things. And as I mentioned earlier, if you'd like to get involved, please reach out to me. You can reach out to me through our contact page on our website, which is www.womenrise chicago.org and again our, our social media pages are at facebook uh, at women rise chicago and then ig and tiktok are and a n d underscore rise underscore once again thank you very much for your time jennifer thank you for having me we have monthly concealed carry license ccl classes in the northwest suburbs of chicago Dates can be seen at firearmmentor.com slash classes. If you have a question, we can be reached at www.firearmmentorcard.com. That is our electronic business card. It has all of our contact information and links in it. It's the easiest way to get a hold of us. Until next time, stay safe out there, and I'll see you at the shooting range. This is Marcus Melnick from Firearm Mentor signing off. The views expressed are not those of local community broadcasting, WYMLLP, or its management, volunteers, or underwriters. <laughs>